Okay, uh, hello and welcome to today's panel titled Iran Nuclear Talks at a Turning Point. My name is Bijan Ahmadi and I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. I'm pleased to be your host today for this timely discussion. IPD is an international affairs think tank operating in Canada and the United States, uh, dedicated to promoting dialogue, diplomacy, prudent realism, and military restraint. Uh, over a year has passed since Biden took office in Washington, D.C., but his administration hasn't been able to restore the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, also known as the Iran nuclear deal so far. Uh, so far, there have been eight rounds of negotiations in, in Vienna to come up with a plan for U.S. and Iran to return to mutual compliance with the terms of the JCPOA. There is limited information available in public about the negotiations and the terms of a potential deal, but in recent weeks, all parties uh, involved uh, in the negotiations have acknowledged that there has been some progress made in the talks. Yet the United States has repeatedly stated that the time is running out with only a few weeks left to revive the nuclear deal. Meanwhile, Russia, reportedly in coordination with the U.S., has proposed an interim agreement with Iran that would involve limited sanctions relief in return for reimposing uh, some restrictions on Tehran's nuclear program. So far, Iran has insisted that they are not looking for an interim deal and will only agree to a permanent solution backed by guarantees and verifications. What's the likelihood of U.S. and Iran reaching a deal in Vienna? If negotiations fail, what plan Bs should we expect from each of these actors and what implications each of these scenarios will have for the region? These are the questions that we will try to answer in today's discussion with our four distinguished panelists. Each of them have years of experience researching the Iran nuclear file, Iran-US tensions, and the politics of the Middle East. I want to, us to have more time to talk with them and hear their perspectives, so I'll only in the introductions mentioned their primary affiliations. Joining us from the United States, Barbara Slevin is the Director of Future, Iran, uh, Future of Iran Initiative at Atlantic Council. Adnan Tabatabai is the CEO of the Center for Applied Research and Partnership with the Orient, a think tank based in Germany. From Washington, DC, we have Trita Parsi joining us. Trita is the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. And Luciano Zakara is an advisor at our institute, the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, and a professor at Qatar University. Thank you all for joining us today. To start the discussion, I want to ask each of our panelists to provide their analysis of the ongoing um, negotiations, at, uh, the, the talks about the Iran nuclear file in Vienna. What do you predict will happen in the coming weeks? Uh, let's start with Barbara. Please go ahead. Well, that's very unfair to start with me, <laughs> but I'm happy to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I was actually hoping to hear from Adnan, uh, his analysis of where Iran is on this, but let me, let me give it a try. Um, look, we've all had moments of optimism, moments of pessimism since these talks uh, began again last year. Uh, I still think Iran needs a deal. I think that the economic imperatives are very strong that despite uh, being able to sell some oil to China, despite high oil prices, uh, that Iran still needs access to approximately $100 billion in assets that are frozen abroad. Uh, it needs that to prop up its currency. It needs that to deal with urgent matters in the country, including COVID. Uh, Iran has become a very poor country in the last few years as a result of COVID, as a result of sanctions, as a result of uh, corruption and mismanagement within the government. And um, however much the, this particular administration wants to show how tough it is, how resistant it is, uh, I think it still needs uh, sanctions relief in order to be able to simply trade with uh, countries like China, Russia, its neighbors more freely than it's able to now. Uh, you know, Iran talks a good game about this, uh, this uh, what is it, $400 billion, 25 year agreement with China. It can't really take advantage of opportunities and China is not really going to uh, sink more money into Iran unless Iran is able to participate in the, in the international financial system to some extent. And while um, there is Bitcoin, there are other currencies, there is 
smuggling, uh, you still need to have some access to that uh, financial system. Uh, the United States owns the pipes of the international financial system. That is simply a fact. And if all of your banks, including your central bank, are sanctioned, are banished from that system, it's very difficult to be able to carry on anything like normal economic activity. Uh, one other point, and, and I'm sure Adnan and others will talk about this, the current administration of Iran run by a man named Ibrahim Raisi um, was elected with the lowest turnout uh, of any election since the formation of the Islamic Republic. Uh, this is not a popular president. This is not a popular administration. And I think they have raised expectations through a number of statements, including even hinting at being willing to talk to the United States directly in Vienna, that there will be some sort of deal and some sort of sanctions relief before the Iranian New Year, before Nowruz in March. So if nothing happens, if sanctions continue, if there is no deal, if uh, Saeed Jalili has his way, uh, you're gonna have a lot of very, very, very unhappy and disappointed people in Iran. And it's already a country that is not exactly in a terrific mood. Uh, so I, I still remain cautiously optimistic that somehow an agreement will be reached in Vienna. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Uh, she's uh, cautiously optimistic. Trita, please go ahead. What's your take on this? Bijan, I think you should give people what they want. They want to hear Adnan. I'll go after. Okay, sure. No problem. Adnan, please go ahead. Then we'll go for Trita and Luciana. Go ahead, Adnan. So I'll imagine people cheering my name. Nice. <laughs> um, Bijan, thank you for setting this up. Great to be on a panel with wonderful colleagues, Luciano, Barbara, and Trita. Um, I am um, maybe even more optimistic than just cautiously optimistic. I would uh, second a lot of things that Barbara said with regards to what Iran needs and what Iran wants. And um, I think that Iran was in, in a bit of a dilemma for a few weeks and months in the sense that the, the government or let's say the, the system, the political establishment wanted to continue the path of the JCPOA. But obviously there was a new government, there's a new president and the new face of Iran's executive branch had to be established, um, a new discourse, a new posture. And let's be honest, um, particularly the Europeans, but maybe also the US side, um, never perceived Iranian moves towards um, easing the setup of the negotiations um, in a way that was helpful to the agreement. What I'm trying to say is that whenever Iran appeared to be too willing, it wasn't really, uh, it, it didn't receive a response that was making life for it easier. So for example, if the nuclear negotiator, if the chief nuclear negotiator had remained at Bas Arabchi, I think the European and US side would have read that as the ultimate will of the Iranians to re-enter the deal, and that might have made life more difficult in the negotiations. But with Ali Bavari Kani, you obviously have to go through, let's call it the pain of interacting with someone who used to be a strong opponent of the agreement, but maybe ultimately that proves to be um, better because through that you really then may be able to, to put something together that is more robust. Um, the other thing that I would like to say is that we should not forget that for neither party, the JCPOA in 2022 can be as valuable as it was in 2015. The Iranian nuclear advances in particular with regards to the knowledge and know-how are irreversible in many respects. The technical sides of it are obviously reversible, but the knowledge Iran has obtained um, in the past years is irreversible. That makes the nuclear file a bigger concern for um, the international community, if we want to call it that. On the other side, for the Iranians, the experience of the US withdrawal, the economic damage that was done is also irreversible. And there were figures of $250 billion of damage that has been done to the Iranian economy. Having said all of that, I think what we saw in the past months since late November, in fact, has been a gradual uh, return to showing willingness to get this thing done. And I think that all parties are now sensing that having no JCPOA is more costly than having one. And the final point that I would like to say is, to me, there is a major shift in Iran. In 2015, the goal was getting sanctions lifted. Now, Iran's long-term strategy is to get sanctions neutralized and to get there, to get sanctions neutralized, to be immune to sanctions, 
you need a time of sanctions being lifted, even if it's just two years until, God forbid, Trump's come, Trump comes back. These two years would be necessary to, to, to boost the Iranian economy in a way that this long term goal of uh, being uh, uh, immune to sanctions can be achieved. I'll leave it here, Bijan. Okay, thanks, Adnan. Trita, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for inviting me. I, I love to be on your panels. Your institute is doing a fantastic job. And of course, being with Barbara and, and Luciano and with uh, Adnan. Uh, I share the optimism about what will happen, likely happen in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I think we see that on the uh, sanctions front, most of the issues have been resolved. On the nuclear front, there's a few question marks left. On the issue of assurances, very little progress has been made. Um, and uh, uh, so I expect that the Iranians will come back. They will accept many of the things that have been put on the table, but they won't say yes. In, instead, the, the talks will probably continue for another two or so weeks. Um, and I do wonder if the US side's uh, um, uh, ambivalence or hesitation to put anything on the table in terms of assurances is a signal for the Europeans and others to be the ones that provide that rather than that coming from the US itself. Where I am pessimistic is not on what will happen in the next couple of weeks. I think it will, there will be a revival of the JCPA. What I'm pessimistic about is about the survivability of the JCPOA. It goes back to what Adnan said as well. I mean, if the Iranian strategy is sanctions neutralization, essentially, it's a strategy to prepare themselves that the JCPOA is not going to be around in a couple of years. Uh, take a look at what happened when uh, Rob Malley, the excellent diplomat that was leading the US effort, uh, tweeted a congratulations to the Iranian soccer team for having qualified for uh, the World Cup soccer. What was astonishing with that tweet was that it had essentially been almost a year of uh, talks or at least the Biden team being in place before something of this kind had been done. Compare that to how the Obama administration conducted its negotiations. They started off, first of all, changing the language, changing the tone, trying to create an atmosphere conducive to diplomacy. This has not happened, not on the Iranian side or on the American side uh, during this term. Instead, we've seen pretty harsh language. If there is a return, it will be a grudging return. As Adnan said, both sides will say that it's a worse deal than it was before. Both sides will probably expect that the deal will not last very long and as a result, really prepare themselves for that scenario, which in and of itself can end up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Add to that the Biden administration's broader Middle East policy, which increasingly appears to be that uh, uh, countering China is the main objective overall for the US foreign policy. The Middle East figures into that by saying that the key element, the key asset that the United States has vis-a-vis -vis China, again, it's not its economy, it's not innovativeness, all of these traditional things, but rather America's alliance system. So the alliance system has become even more important than it was before. This means that the United States is going to do more and give more to its partners in the region in order to ensure that they don't switch side or that they become too close to the Chinese. This is part of the reason I think we're seeing a really um, um, a shameful re uh, reversal on Yemen in which Biden promised to uh, end that war and instead is now uh, very actively uh, uh, siding with Saudi Arabia and then the language coming out of the administration on Yemen is as if the Houthis had attacked Ohio or Wisconsin uh, when they struck UAE. Uh, and this is, this is very important because I think in that context, if we're going to have that type of um, uh, approach towards the region in which we're going to be in increasingly uh, uh, deferring to regional states that we call strategic partners, that too is going to create a scenario in which the pressures on the longevity of the JCPA is going to be simply overwhelming. And I fear that all of these different factors are going to lead to a scenario in which the JCPA likely will be revived, but likely also will not survive more than two, three years. Thank you, Trita. Uh, Luciano, please go ahead. Okay, thank you for, for inviting me uh, to be with these uh, great uh, colleagues. Uh, someone has to be the pessimistic here, so I will be the one. Uh, actually, I mean, I used to be more optimistic. I actually expected this uh, deal to be signed uh, some time ago. Uh, I would say that I expected this deal to be signed before Rouhani was ending because this would give RIC uh, free hands to when it was already the, 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 the deal signed before he, 
he assumed his power. But anyway, now we are in the situation that we are still waiting. Again, we are hearing that that there is a matter of weeks. I tend to think that this is going to take much longer. I don't think in this round will be uh, finalized. Uh, I still think that the one that needs the most this deal is Iran. So the ones that needs to make more concessions in this case is Iran. I agree with Annan. We are not uh, in 2015. So the situation that we are now facing with all the advances, technological advances that Iran already achieved are not reversible uh, or the knowledge that they acquire is not reversible. So it's impossible from the Iranian uh, side to pretend that um, we are coming back to the original JCPOA without any further uh, addition. So uh, this will take uh, much longer to be accepted by the Iranians because I think that the Iranians are the most needed to to get this deal uh, at the end of the day because they, this is a country which is under sanction. The problem is that when we see what happened since the signature of the JCPOA in 2015, until the abrogation by by Trump in 2018, we we can see that the benefits were not that high either uh, for Iran in terms of what they were expecting, uh, meaning that the investment coming from the West, uh, coming from Europe, mainly did not happen. Uh, so, what would happen if any kind of deal is signed from now on, uh, if there are no enough guarantees that in two years Trump will be again? Uh, in power or any other Republican president that would uh, withdraw from the deal again. And how this would impact not only the US, because I don't think the Iranians now would, would trust 100% on the US again, but on the other uh, allies or the other partners that Iran was trying to, to engage in, in the Iranian economy. If nothing happened with all the guarantees that they were given in 2015 with the support of the United Nations, uh, and no major uh, investment uh, happened during this first three years of, of the deal. Um, I mean, what expectations the Iranian would have that the uh, similar deal or same deal or similar deal that we signed with the US would attract uh, other European uh, investments. Um, the other side, I mean, China or the other parts that they were there and they never abandoned Iran, they will never do it. So again, we are discussing about something that uh, should have a bigger impact on the on the Iranian economy and to attract much more investment than it happened before because the economic situation of Iran now compared with 2015 is worse, uh, not only because of sanctions, but because of the combination of sanctions with the, uh, the COVID um, pandemic that affected not only Iran, but all the uh, oil uh, producing countries uh, in the region and this is something that here in the in the context of the GCC we can also uh, notice or we notice in the last few years so I am pessimistic in the sense that I don't expect this is going to be solved in a couple of weeks I think maybe it will be required another round of uh, negotiations but at the end of the day I am still optimistic uh, because I think that both uh, size, they want a deal, otherwise they wouldn't be uh, discussing or they wouldn't be uh, negotiating. And there are many other regional partners, including Qatar, including Russia, that they are also trying to uh, contribute or mediate in the negotiation. So many uh, actors are trying to convince both sides that is, uh, this deal is necessary, not only for the benefit of Iran, but for the benefit of the region. Uh, we can discuss later what happened in 2015 in the region if this bill, peace, uh, this uh, deal, sorry, uh, brought more peace or more security in the region or more stability, and how this can affect the future of the region as well. Okay, uh, thank you everyone for your opening statements. You all brought up important points that I want to follow up on. I want this to be an engaging discussion, so uh, I, I point my questions to specific panelists, but feel free to jump in. And, and briefly comment or react to uh, something that you hear from other panelists. And for our audience, uh, please, uh, if you have any questions, uh, send them, write them in the Q&A box here on Zoom. Um, we'll definitely cover as many questions as possible from the ones that you submit in the last 15 minutes of this session. Uh, Barbara, let me ask you about the timeline of these uh, negotiations. The Biden administration has repeatedly stated that there is limited time left to reach a deal in Vienna. And in matters of weeks, uh, by mid to end of February, 
uh, they reach a point when restoring the JCPOA will be impossible because of Iranian nuclear advances. Is this a realistic timeline to reach an agreement? Luciano talked about this as well. And how flexible do you think the administration will be in changing this uh, timeline uh, uh, for, for the negotiations. The reason I'm asking this is that some believe that setting these deadlines is, is a negotiating tactic, but others say that Iran's nuclear program is reaching a point when restoring the non-proliferation benefits of the JCPOA becomes impossible after a certain point. What's your take on this? Sure. Um, you know, I think a lot depends on the progress of the Iranian nuclear program. So, it's really within Iran's power to slow down the stockpiling of uh, highly enriched uranium, for example. Um, we saw a, a step, an interesting step, and I'd be interested to hear the comments of others on the panel. Iran is apparently moving its centrifuge manufacturing to a new facility um, uh, in Isfahan. Now, does this mean it's going to slow down the production of advanced centrifuges? Uh, how much of a stockpile does Iran have? If, there, if, if there's a slowing down there, then we'll see fewer statements, I think, from Washington that they're getting more and more impatient. Um, that said, I keep hearing that there is kind of an informal uh, deadline of, of Nodus of, of March 21st, that um, somehow by that point in time, uh, we should have the deal pretty much done, if not entirely done. After that, I think it becomes more difficult uh, on all sides, really, to get this, this done. And again, given the mood in Iran, I mean, I think this would be an enormous boost for people if, if this could be done before the new year. Thanks, Barbara. Um, I think, you know, most of the panelists uh, were optimistic of that, that potentially at the end we'll reach a deal uh, in Vienna, whether in February or, or March. But Trita, what is Biden's plan B if negotiations fail? We should consider that probability as well. In, in Washington, some, including those who opposed the original deal in 2015, are calling on the administration to put more economic and diplomatic pressure on Iran and to make sure that there is a credible military option on the table. They accuse Biden of being soft on Iran, uh, but Biden came to White House, we all know, promising more diplomacy and ending U.S. endless wars. So what do you think his administration will do if he fails to restore uh, the JCPOA, at least in the next uh, couple of months? I think the plan B is essentially a fantasy. Um, the United States itself knows that it maxed out on what it could do economically to hurt the Iranians. Not to say that they can not add more pain. They certainly can. And as time goes on and the Biden administration continues maximum pressure sanctions as they have done, certainly the Iranians will hurt tremendously as they currently are. But the idea that that pain will translate into them breaking and, and shifting their position. Uh, I don't know anyone in the administration that actually believes that. In fact, if you take a look at their own public statements prior to joining the administration, the amount of criticism against uh, uh, maximum pressure was uh, immense. Uh, and they were quite correct in that crit critique. And they're quite correct today when they're pointing out that this entire crisis is precisely because of maximum pressure. Maximum pressure produced this moment, the idea that it will be the resolution, the, the solution to this moment um, uh, is, is difficult to convince anyone. Uh, but what they will end up trying to do is uh, most likely to put pressure on the Europeans and that the Europeans have to come in with some of their sanctions, uh, arguing essentially that uh, there hadn't been a full maxing out on the European side, but how that would actually make a, a difference, again, making suddenly maximum pressure work is really difficult to see. So instead, I think if talks fail, we're gonna go in back into a situation in which there will be mutual escalation on both sides. Um, and that mutual escalation means further Iranian activities um, uh, on the nuclear front and uh, further continuation of existing sanctions and, and some additional ones on, on the uh, European and American side. Uh, and both sides will essentially uh, calculate that uh, if, as time goes by, uh, hopefully some circumstances will change and the balance uh, within, uh, uh, you know, between these two sides will shift in such a way so that potentially a breakthrough can happen. The alternative is, of course, what I've written about elsewhere, which is a, a coma uh, alternative in which all sides essentially actually pretend that diplomacy has not fully failed, but they do go back towards uh, a more measured uh, uh, version of mutual escalation. 
but they're essentially trying to keep the option of diplomacy alive by pretending that it's alive, very much similar to what we're doing with the two-state solution, which is going on for 25 years. Uh, we're pretending that it's alive, although it's a complete dead core. But bottom line is, everyone knows there is no um, uh, good alternative to a diplomatic resolution. In fact, um, this goes to what Adnan said earlier on. The benefits of the JCPA are seen as being less on both sides compared to 2015. The negative consequences of not having a JCPA, dire as they still are, are still not being seen as being as dire as they were in 2013, 2014, when the alternative very clearly was that there would be a military confrontation. I don't think anyone is seriously convinced of that on either side of these talks at this point. And it doesn't matter if the, if the British uh, Foreign Secretary is saying in Parliament that all options are on the table. That actually almost underscores that they're not. Um, so, and I think this is part of the reason why it's been more difficult perhaps to get a deal because the cost of failure has simply not been as high as it was in 2012, 2013. Thanks. Uh, Adnan, uh, Europe is now dealing with its own problems, especially uh, tensions with Russia over Ukraine. What will be uh, Europeans' response if negotiations fail? Are they ready to follow Biden's uh, plan B if we think that there is one? Uh, or is it possible that we see disagreements between Europeans and the US, similar to what uh, happened, for example, under the Trump administration, uh, if Biden wants to take a tougher approach uh, against Iran? Bijan John, let me start by <clears throat> quoting someone who I usually wouldn't like to quote, and that's Elliot Abraham when he was the head of the action group in the State Department. In an interview with CNN with Christian Amanpour, he literally said, European governments don't matter. What matter to us are the European companies that won't do any business with Iran as long as the Treasury Department or OFAC doesn't give them the license to do so. And, and economy and or let's say European companies, Iran's econo uh, Europe's economic uh, resources, power is what Iran wants from Europe, nothing else. So in other words, um, Europe will, even if politically motivated to do so, not be able to compensate for anything that the US um, would, would not want to give to Iran to stick to the JCPOA and will follow suit um, even more willingly than they in fact did under Trump as well. So we really saw the starkest contrast between Europe and the US in the Trump years. And even though we got some unprecedented statements coming from European capitals, particularly Brussels uh, towards Washington, nothing meaningful happened. So this is, I think, the lesson that uh, Iran took note of the world talk, took note of, and even European governments um, realized. Therefore, I would just simply answer your question uh, now by saying Europe would definitely follow in the sense that they would not push back against any Biden um, approach if uh, Plan A, restoring the JCPOA, fell apart. Okay, thanks, Adnan. Um, Luciano, let's talk about the uh, Iran's Persian Gulf neighbors. In recent months, there have been talks between Iran and United Arab Emirates and also Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, perhaps for de-escalating regional tensions. Uh, there is talk of even uh, perhaps Iran and Saudi Arabia re-establishing diplomatic relations and reopening uh, their embassies. If negotiations fail, what implications will this have for the region? Uh, and what will be uh, UAE and Saudi's response and, and, and overall, the GCC position and course of action moving forward? Well, first of all, I mean, uh, you, you, we all know that there is no a common GCC position anymore regarding uh, Iran. And we see how Qatar has been very active in trying to, to mediate, uh, recently visiting Iran and the United States at the same time, I mean, or one day after the other, in order to, to give some impression that there are signals being transmitted from, from one place to the other. So this gives you an idea that uh, there are uh, countries in the region that they are very uh, actively pursuing uh, an, an agreement because they think that the best way to guarantee stability in, in, the, in the Gulf region is through uh, an agreement. Uh, again, we cannot say that this is the same that in 2015. In 2015, it was the opposite when the sign was uh, the, the, uh, the, the deal was signed. Sorry, uh, there was a general perception that this deal would affect tremendously stability in the region that would give Iran the chance to, in, uh, to increase its influence in the region. And therefore, most of the countries, including Qatar and including uh, Emirates and Saudi Arabia, were uh, very worried that 
uh, that this deal was actually successful. However, officially, they supported it because it was, at the end of the day, uh, a diplomatic solution uh, of a long-term uh, problem without without the war, without insulting the war. I think that the situation changed. There was a realization from all the GC states that uh, a deal is much better than not having a deal because the situation that happened after Trump decided to pull out from the deal was even worse. I mean, the instability created in 2018, I mean, 19 mainly, uh, affected the economy and of, of all the all, all the GCC states, and also endanger their own security. So um, directly or indirectly, because of the uh, the situation that was generated between the United States and Iran. Therefore, I assume that most of the GCC states would be much better or much happier if a, G, a new JCPOA or nuclear deal is signed than if Iran is not. Uh, included in any deal, and therefore there would be a plan B from the United States. That said, um, I don't think that any of the GC states are interested in following up with the new uh, aggressive approach from the United States to, to Iran, that they would try to de-link the, the, the relations with Iran with any uh, uh, more aggressive approach from the United States. So Qatar never cut relations uh, with Iran. I don't see why if the JCPOA fail or the agreement fails, Qatar would, would uh, break relations uh, with Iran uh, now. Uh, and as you said, both Saudi Arabia and Emirates are trying to reestablish or to reduce the tension in, in, in the region. I think that uh, if this, um, uh, this tension between Iran and Emirates and Saudi Arabia is not derailed because of regional issues, I don't think it will be derailed because of the failure of the JCPOA. And I, I, I understand also that Iran is interested uh, in not transferring the, um, the cost of the failure of the nuclear deal to the GCC as well, because Iran is also interested in, in trying to, to maintain the stability in the region. It is planned that Raisi would be visiting Emirates soon. Um, so I, I don't see why uh, neither the GC states or Iran would transfer the cost of the failure to, to the bilateral relations. Thanks. Go ahead, Barbara. Yeah, I just uh, I just read this morning that apparently Raisi is not going to the UAE uh, because, uh, let's face it, despite the negotiations, we have the situation in Yemen and the attacks by the Houthis using Iranian drones on the UAE uh, have, uh, how should we put it, put a... a uh, uh, created a setback <laughs> in Iran UAE relations. Um, so, you know, we can, I mean, the nuclear issue is one thing, but the regional problems have gotten worse, as, as you pointed out, Luciana. And, and the Yemen situation, I think, is really quite urgent now, um, particu particularly for the Emiratis. Now, there's the question of whether Iran, having given these weapons to the Houthis, can get them to stop. And uh, there's a question about whether the Emirates will rethink its re-intervention in the Yemen war, given the attacks that have taken place. Um, but it, it's complicated. And uh, there, I've also read that the Houthis now are showing their displeasure at uh, the UAE's recognition of Israel. Um, so even if we get the JCPOA back, I'm not sure that's going to provide a solution for these kinds of issues. Yeah, this, if, if you allow me, this is what I, what I meant, that. Uh, if the distension in the region is not derailed because of regional issues, I don't think the JCP will have that impact. Uh, that, 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 that's why my, my idea, but yeah, I, I agree that, that the situation in, uh, in the region is becoming more complicated because of other, other issues, mainly, mainly the situation in, in Yemen, but this, uh, uh, I think also another group from Iraq uh, uh, claim an attack on, on, on Emirates recently, and they are also backed by, by, by the Iranians. So this is creating even much more, more problems and it's even dragging Iraq on the Yemen issue uh, as well. Uh, um, Anon, would you like to uh, comment on this as well? I know that you've been working on uh, Iran's relations with the Persian Gulf neighbors. So if you would like to comment on this, please go ahead. Look, I, um, I think one thing is remarkable and that is even though these attacks happened, the recent attacks by the Houthis on Abu Dhabi, um, this could have led to much more public uh, shaming 
And in fact, uh, the foreign ministers had a phone call either yesterday or the day before yesterday. And I think both sides agreed that a state visit this time, um, in this point of time might have been going too far. But the fact that there was no public statement and denunciation of Iran's role in backing the Houthis um, by neither the, the United Arab Emirates nor, nor the Saudis shows us that there is already an um, advanced stage of communication and dialogue between these uh, key major reg regional players. And um, while we are certainly not there yet, and Barbara is right by saying the JCPOA really won't pacify the region, um, we can see through these indicators that um, these talks that happened last year in Baghdad mainly have produced something. And that is that incidents like the major attack by the Houthis on Abu Dhabi is not derailing a process of dialogue currently, at least. Uh, thanks. Uh, Barbara, the Israeli government has stated repeatedly that they're not going to be bound by any new deal reached in Vienna. Uh, also, reportedly, there, ha there are disagreements between the Israeli military intelligence and Mossad, uh, with the military believing that having a deal is better to limit Iran's nuclear program. If a deal is reached in Vienna, do you think that the bennett uh, Lapid government will do same as what Netanyahu did in uh, reaction to Obama's 2015 deal and try to undermine the new agreement? Or should we expect a different and more constructive approach from Bennett's government? Hmm. Well, that's a great question. I mean, we know that this is a very, uh, this is a very broad government with a very wide coalition. So Bennett may represent one, one aspect of it, but certainly not all of it. I'm a little more opt optimistic on the, the Israeli front. I think we've seen extraordinary consultation between the, uh, the Biden team and the Israelis, so they know exactly where things are going. Um, and we've also seen an outpouring of comment from former officials in particular, uh, in intelligence, Mossad military, uh, that the JCPOA wasn't bad and having the JCPOA was better than having no JCPOA. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the Israelis are, again, they'll be looking toward things like situation in Syria that are more immediately affecting their security, and they will be quite happy if uh, the Iranian program can be uh, paused and rolled back to some extent, uh, despite the, the language that we sometimes see coming from, from Bennett. So I'm, I'm not as concerned on that front. Okay, thanks. Uh, Trita, let's talk about the guarantees that uh, Tehran is demanding from Washington. That has been one of the major hurdles in the negotiations uh, between P4 plus one uh, in, in Vienna. Uh, Tehran wants guarantees that uh, Biden or future administrations will not leave the deal and reimpose sanctions. Uh, you wrote a piece, if I remember correctly, after the last round of negotiations under Rouhani's government, that the Biden administration up to that point um, even refused to provide any guarantees about his own uh, administration. Do you think Biden's position has changed ever since? What sort of guarantees do you think the Biden administration will provide to Iranians in a potential deal that, that I think most of us are optimistic that will uh, that will reach at some point in the next month or two? Yeah, the Biden team's approach on what they will do or not do during their own term has changed. And it was manifested first in the statement that the E3 made together with Biden, in which for the first time, the United States said that uh, the US will stick to the deal uh, as long as Biden is president. Whether that then has been translated into specific mechanisms or other things beyond the press release, uh, I'm not entirely clear on. I think what has happened in the course of all of this, you know, look, there are solutions to this issue. The idea that there isn't is, is frankly preposterous. Uh, of course, this can be addressed. Uh, the, uh, the Security Council mechanism of a snapback did not even exist before the JCPOA, was invented for the JCPOA in order to ensure that if there was any Iranian cheating, the United States and its allies would not have to go through what usually is a very lengthy process of convincing enough countries to vote for uh, a sanctions resolution in the UN Security Council. It can take a year, it can take two years. They made sure that they made a, a, a mechanism that actually completely overturned the rules of the Security Council so that uh, the P5 states actually did not have a veto. They could not stop this. Um, uh, and, you know, it's an unprecedented thing. So there are mechanisms in the original deal to make sure to deter 
the Iranians from cheating. There are no such mechanisms in the original deal to deter an American uh, exit. And that turned out to be a far more likely thing than an Iranian exit. I fear though that we have reached a point in which uh, the sides are now convinced that the political will to create uh, sufficient mechanisms and assurances simply does not exist. And that is feeding into what I said earlier on, uh, that this is gonna be a respite. This is gonna be a two and a half year break uh, in which all sides are gonna try to use that reduction of tension to reposition themselves. But the expectation that the deal actually can last much longer than that, I don't uh, believe actually exists. And keep also in mind, if the deal is restored, and hopefully it is, um, uh, unless some changes are made to its internal schedule, which were that has not been discussed publicly, the Biden administration needs to go to Congress in 2023, next year, and request Congress to vote, vote for lifting several of the American sanctions. Congress almost never votes to lift sanctions. The extent to which sanctions are lifted is because of executive orders or waivers that are used within them, but actually taking them away by, through votes almost never happens. In fact, if you take a look at what happened in Cuba, uh, what the Biden administration did in its rapprochement with Cuba is to lift all of the executive orders. It did not actually touch the embargo itself. So having that fight and the political capital that requires a year before the 2024 American presidential election, it's gonna be really, really tough. So all of these things coming together, and again, uh, with uh, the, what so far seems to have been an absence of a real effort to address the assurances issues, um, I think it's creating this uh, expectation on all sides that this is not gonna be something that lasts for long. It's definitely worthwhile. It should be re reinstituted, but it's not gonna be the same thing as it was before in terms of having a longevity of 10, 15 years. Thanks, Trita. So uh, let me follow up uh, on this with you. Uh, you mentioned the role that Congress will play in 2023 uh, with respect to one of the sunsets in, in the original JCPOA. Now, there is an argument uh, by some who oppose uh, changing the mechanisms uh, within JCPOA that if Biden changes anything in JCPOA, uh, INARA, the um, Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, will be triggered. And then Biden needs to take this new agreement or revised agreement uh, to the U.S. Congress, and there is uh, there will be an opportunity for uh, Republicans in the Congress uh, to pass uh, this approval uh, resolution against this revised deal. Uh, because, for example, if Biden wants to provide Iran with mechanisms for guarantees and changes the mechanisms within uh, the deal, uh, you know that's a change deal, so it needs to go through that review process. What's your take on that? Um, do you agree with that argument or not? Well, first of all, I think right there, you may have a better explanation as to why there's a sense of urgency in the Biden administration rather than the non-proliferation arguments uh, in the sense that, you know, imagine having to go through INARA after the midterm elections in the United States, mindful of how things are looking right now. Um, INARA can absolutely be kicked in if there are any specific changes to the agreement, then it would be viewed as a new agreement. Now, I'm sure the lawyers in the White House have numerous arguments as to whatever um, uh, things are agreed upon are not necessarily changes to the agreement. For instance, when it comes to mechanisms uh, for assurances, um, those are not changing the give and take between the US and Iran. Those are ensuring that the give and take that already was agreed upon actually can be delivered. That's a very different thing from actually saying, okay, now the Iranians are getting more or the US is giving more or the US is giving less. The actual give and take is not changed. But what is addressed is to make sure that what has been agreed upon actually can be implemented. So I'm pretty confident that there are many different ways in which those things will not kick in in ARA. There are other suggestions that some of the ones that the Iranians have put forward that I do think the administration is quite correct in saying that actually would be a change. For instance, the Iranians have suggested as one guarantee or assurance for them is that instead of them shipping out the LEU, which they're supposed to do and only uh, keep uh, less than 400 kilos of low enriched uranium, that they will actually store it somewhere else in Iran under IEA seal, but it will still be in Iranian territory. That is a direct change to the actual deal. That would kick in in Iran, and I think the administration is correct to saying that that's a non-starter. But there's plenty of other ideas that I don't think fall into that category because it doesn't change the give and take. It just changes how we can ensure that the give and take actually takes place. Um, thank you, Trita. So, Adnan, um... About the guarantees, um, without firm guarantees, I I'm sure that the Iranians are familiar, they have experts who are familiar with the United States uh, system of governance, so they understand the 
you know, the details of how that system works. Because some people argue in media as if the Iranians have no clue um, uh, what is the system of governance uh, in the United States and want to, you know, educate them that the United States government cannot provide guarantees. So from the perspective of Iranians, what sort of guarantees do you think um, they're looking for? And do you think Islamic Republic will agree to a deal if uh, they're not provided with those sort of guarantees? Thanks for the question, Bijan. I think um, it's it's difficult to to really uh, to be confident that there is enough creativity to uh, develop suggestions as to what can be replacements of a guarantee or the compensation of the of the impossibility of giving guarantees. Um, I remember back in the day uh, delivering dozens of Boeing airplanes may have been something like this because then um, Iran, uh, American business interests are in fact invested into Iran. Similarly, the idea of, of, of broadening Iran-US trade uh, was viewed as something that could guarantee that the US sticks to the agreement. Um, something like this in the current domestic mood, uh, both in Iran as, as well as in the US is, is to, in my view, uh, difficult to imagine. Um, as to whether there are other suggestions like this, um, I'm not familiar with them. I'm quite sure that there are some on the table and that speaking about the need for guarantees, in fact, raises the price tag when the US side has to tell the Iranians there won't be guarantees. So then we will give you, we will have to, or the Iranians would say you would have to give us A, B, C, D instead of a guarantee. I'm, um, there are maybe some who are more uh, in, informed about how this is then in the end ultimately um, played out. Um, but the, the core underlying Iranian position is we were fooled once, we must not be fooled one more time because then we ourselves have to blame ourselves. So this is why um, um, there is this, this, this price tag I was talking about. Thanks, Adnan. Uh, Luciano, uh, Qataris have been trying to uh, you know, mediate between the United States uh, and Iran. Um, on the issue of guarantees and, and overall the survivability of, of any new potential deal that we're going to uh, see from Vienna, what do you think the regional actors can do to ensure that any new agreement lasts beyond the Biden administration? Well, this is a very interesting question, but I'm not quite sure I can reply to that. Uh, actually, I, I, I mean, it's true that the Qatar is doing a great day for and is trying to show uh, its diplomatic muscle in dealing with many things in which United States are, are involved in the region and which uh, Qatar and other countries are involved in, like uh, Afghanistan. Um, but even though um, Qatar is uh, well respected in, in Iran in terms of diplomatics, uh, diplomatic activities, uh, and I mean, uh, uh, Iran understood many things that uh, Qatar had to do uh, uh, in the past that did not please that much uh, the Iranians in, in regional uh, scenarios. Uh, I think that there is an overestimation of the Qatari capacity to really uh, mediate between Iran and the United States. I mean, the fact that uh, Qatar has been uh, um, appointed as uh, extra NATO ally, I don't think it will please that much the Iranians. At least they will not mm, consider this as a, a positive step in, in bilateral relations Iranian Qatar. So I think that there is uh, sometimes an overestimation of what Qatar can do for Iran. I mean, maybe the, the, the uh, Qatari capacity to, to, to influence in the United States increase, this is undeniable, but the Qatari capacity to, 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 uh, to mediate or to uh, convince uh, the Iranians about something, I think is much more reduced. So it's difficult to, to, to say what they can give the Iranians that the United States are not guaranteeing. I mean, I think that the, what I mentioned before, all these states, they realize that a, a bad deal now is much better than no deal because they saw what happened when there was no deal. Uh, before the signature of the JCPOA and after 2018 when the maximum uh, pressure was uh, pushing uh, Iran to the limits and how Iran reacted and how uh, the situation became much more volatile than before, uh, creating this situation of asymmetric uh, 
kind of warfare between the United States and Iran or ally, uh, proxies, uh, allies of Iran that made the situation much more um, difficult to solve without a real engagement of the United States in, in, a, in a long uh, range war that nobody wanted to enter in. Um, so I assume that both, I mean, all, all the GCCs will do their best in order to, to, to give Iran guarantees that they will have nothing to do with any plan B the United States will try to implement if the, the GCPA fail. But I don't think they can do anything to guarantee what the United States would do or what would do if the United States in two years will, will pull out. I, I assume that if uh, diplomatic relations with, uh, with Saudi would, uh, would be restored, uh, the only guarantee that they can give all the GCC states is that uh, what happened with the United States will not affect the bilateral relations. And this is what Qatar has been trying to do all this time. Every time there was a problem with the United States, uh, Qatar was in direct communication with Iran saying, we have nothing to do. Uh, with what happened when uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, was killed in Iraq. Qataris were very quick in uh, making sure the Iranians knew that the uh, planes did not depart from, from Qatar base to make sure that uh, there was not a retaliation against uh, Qatar. So I think that this is the only thing that uh, GCC countries uh, can do. And this is why I keep saying that uh, GCC states are trying to differentiate between what is the confrontation with the United States and what is the confrontation with the GZ states uh, and to try to find solutions, bilateral solutions that have in mind the security concerns of all the regional states. And okay, if you cannot fix the problem with the United States, this is your problem, deal with that uh, is another, another matter. Thank you. Let me just jump in there very quickly. Uh, I think Luciana is absolutely right. There's very little uh, countries like Qatar can do when it comes to the broader U.S.-Iran uh, and certainly when it comes to the issues of assurances. But what I think the Qataris can do, and I suspect they are doing, is to help with uh, um, uh, a prisoner exchange. Uh, we have seen that in the uh, past, when there has been prisoner exchanges, those have almost always taken place as a result or thanks to the mediation of either a regional or European state. Oman has played a significant role in several of the previous ones. The Swiss, of course, have played an instrumental role in many of these. Uh, and if this is something that the Qataris help out with successfully, it is a major, major um, um, help and, and, and uh, favor to both the Iranians and to uh, uh, the United States side, but most obviously to all of the prisoners that will be exchanged or hostages that will be exchanged. Um, uh, because at the end of the day, this is also going to be a very politically sensitive question for the administration. They've already said straight out that they're not going to have a JCP without a prisoner exchange. Um, uh, and I think that statement probably signaled that there had been some significant progress on that front already. Thanks, Rita. Um, Barbara, if, if firm guarantees are not possible, uh, and there is risk that, um, you know, the next administration, can, especially if it's a Republican administration, can repeat what happened in 2018. Uh, what needs to be done? If there is a new, let's say that there is a new deal in the coming weeks or months, what needs to be done uh, to ensure that this deal survives beyond this administration? Or what, or what can be done uh, to help in that front? Uh, uh, you know, there, there are no firm guarantees uh, if, if the White House changes hands uh, in, in 2024. But I mean, you know, optimistically, uh, if this does lead to a wider de-escalation in the region, if we don't see uh, attacks on Americans in Iraq or Syria anymore, uh, if somehow the Yemen war calms down, I mean, if we get a virtuous circle of events out of this, that could certainly uh, help. Um, we did have, of course, just uh, just the other day, the U.S. Uh, killing the new head, uh, the latest head of ISIS. And I think we should remind ourselves, and the Iranians should be reminded, that the U.S. presence in the Middle East sometimes is uh, in uh, Iran's advantage when it comes to dealing with groups like the Islamic State. Um, U.S. and Iran have the same position on that. There are possibilities regarding Afghanistan as well, uh, given the presence of ISIS there. Um, so, I mean, optimistically, if a, 
if a resurrection of the JCPOA is followed by other positive developments, if, it's, if there's a prisoner exchange, if Iran doesn't pick up more hostages as it has been its habit, um, but, uh, but actually stops that practice at least for a while. Uh, the U.S. wants to focus on other issues, it wants to focus on China. It has a major issue with, with Russia and Ukraine right now. You know, get all of this off the front pages and then you have an opportunity. Um, if you have, even if you have a Republican who comes in 2024, if, if it's not Donald Trump, if it's someone more pragmatic, uh, if the benefits of the JCPOA are obvious by then, I mean, there is still a limitation in the deal up until January 2031, Iran can't have more than 300 kilograms of low enriched uranium, and you can't make a bomb with that. That is the most important aspect of the JCPOA uh, from the non-proliferation standpoint, from, from my point of view. And it's worth resurrecting the deal, I think, just for that. On Iran's side, they're going to get access to $100 billion in, in frozen uh, funds. And uh, I think they're going to want to be able to use that money. Um, not just for nefarious purposes, but also for domestic uh, development to help prop up the economy, to help deal with poverty. Uh, so, um, you know, get a virtuous cycle going and, uh, and maybe, uh, maybe it can survive a little bit longer than, than Trita thinks. I, I, I think, look, step one is get the thing back, you know, and then let's try to learn from the mistakes we made before on all sides uh, and, and build on this. Um, so a quick follow-up uh, with you, Trita, on, uh, on the survivability of a potential new deal, and then I'll go to Adnan and Luciano. Um, so th there was a report yesterday that U.S. officials believe that any new potential deal with Iran, uh, with any new uh, potential deal with Iran, they will achieve a shorter breakout time uh, for the Iranian nuclear program, uh, possibly some, some time, uh, some, somewhere between like six to nine months. Do you think that uh, obviously people who are concerned about the non-proliferation risk, they're concerned um, about this shorter breakout. But do you think that that will make the deal um, uh, more resilient, perhaps uh, solve the imbalance that existed uh, in the original deal, or it will make everything worse and the new administration will be easier for a new for uh, for uh, the next administration, a Republican administration to easily withdraw from the deal because of that? Um, shorter uh, breakout period. So I've seen the argument that essentially saying that if Iran has a six month uh, breakout capability as a result of the new JCPOA, it will make it more difficult for the United States to pull out. Iran will have leverage. Uh, it will be more dangerous. Uh, I understand that argument in theory, but I think it kind of misses um, the point because the, it, it will be very effective in deterring another democratic pro-JCPOA administration from walking out of the JCPOA, which they didn't want to walk away from in the first place. But it will not be particularly effective against the Republican administration who either doesn't care who, or, or actually is open to the idea that this could lead to a military confrontation. I think the Trump administration would fall into the first category, at least Trump would fall into the first category. He didn't care, he didn't understand. Uh, Mike Pompeo, John Bolton would fall into the second category. They wanted war. So uh, it, it will be effective in deterring an, an administration that doesn't need to be deterred and will be ineffective in deterring an administration that actually needs to be deterred. So in that sense, I don't see really what the gain is, except for perhaps the Iranians being able to make some political points out of it. Uh, but it doesn't resolve the issue. Um, and then when, when it comes to the broader point here is that the, um, uh, the breakout time, you know, when it was first chosen as 12 months, it was frankly quite arbitrary. And I got this straight from, uh, administration officials who said, look, we could have done one to nine months, but 12 months just sounds better because you can say it's a year. Six months, however, was a little bit dicier because the fear was that if it's only six months, will the United States then have enough ma uh, latitude and maneuverability to have any other option but a military option? Um, and, and that's why it would be ultimately bad, I think, if, if it were to go down to that. But that is a consequence of the United States walking out of the deal. Um, you cannot turn this around and blame it on the administration, on the Biden administration. We would not be in this situation if the, the previous administration had not turned it out. And for all of those who are pumping up this argument in the media, I mean, there's their job, but they really failed at their job early on to raise this issue. 
because we went from a breakout capability of 12 months to three weeks as a result of what Trump did. And there was very little noise in the media about how dangerous that is. But now suddenly you're seeing these arguments that, oh, this new deal is not going to be good as, as good as the old deal. At some point, some degree of consistency is simply warranted. Thanks, Rita. Um, Adnan, you closely follow the internal dynamics in Iran. Uh, the public were extremely supportive of the nuclear deal back in 2015. After Trump's withdrawal, uh, the, the support has, has declined. Uh, we now have an administration in Tehran that includes those who strongly oppose rapprochement with the West, including the head of Iran's negotiating team in Vienna now. Um, what's the internal dynamics uh, in Iran, in your opinion? How much the maximum pressure campaign changed the public uh, opinion in Iran on, uh, on sort of the, the general idea of uh, rapprochement and dialogue with the West? Um, well, I would, I would say that um, the lack of interest is scathing. The lack of interest in what the fate of the JCPOA will be can really be sensed in, in every conversation. Um, and I mean, I'm not among those who said, I just come back from Tehran and I talked to everybody on the street, but I happened to speak to some people when I was there. Um, and I mean, the, the, what strikes me always is that you, you, you basically have this... Um, this 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 really bad experience of of huge euphoria in 2015 and then nothing came out of it and it got worse than it ever was before um and and look you have a political establishment that in fact knows how to roll in such a context you know the theme of resistance barbara mentioned it in, in her opening remarks resistance that only makes sense when there is pressure on you what do you resist if there is no pressure and even let's take it one step further. If you resist, you are victorious if you don't die. If you survive, you have already won. So what do you need as the political establishment of the Islamic Republic is to simply survive. You don't need meaningful growth. You don't need sustainable development. When you are under pressure, you can just say, look, we survived. What else do you expect us to do? And I talked to someone who, who, who was um, significantly active in rolling out the vaccination campaign. He was basically telling me, look, under these circumstances, more than 70% have already received their first dose and far more than half of the population have been vaccinated twice. Which other country under our circumstances could have done that? And of course, this argument flies when you are under maximum pressure. And up until this day, those sanctions are in place. What I'm trying to say is the argument for those who have been pro-West, pro-engagement, um, are really on a, on a weak position. Um, I wouldn't even say people are angry. People are getting just, as I said, less interested, exhausted, tired. Um, I mean, I won't go as far as to say depressed, but um, you know, it's like when there is really no, no, um, no, no, no glimmer of hope to look at. Of course, if the JCPOA is restored and if livelihoods are meaningfully um, um, eased in terms of living conditions, then of course there might be some positive vibes coming back. And Barbara made that point. We are heading towards Nuruz. Maybe it's a good time to try and. Um, and, and, and really make that happen. Um, there is one more thing uh, that, that I think we should also keep in mind when it comes to the regional dimensions, and that, I, that is that this idea of neutralizing sanctions does also entail to broaden economic relations with immediate neighbors. For example, those in the, uh, to the south of the Persian Gulf, as we say in Iran. <laughs> Um, and um, that means that these economic relations could be broadened. And one thing the U.S. might be able to, to give to Iran is to say that the U.S. wouldn't oppose the GCC states from broadening their economic relations with, uh, with Iran. Back to you, Bishop. Thank you, Adnan. Um, Lucian, I wanted to ask you about uh, the role of China and Russia. Here we have a question from our audience that's um, kind of related at least to um, a Russian role. So let me ask you this. Are the dynamics of the JCPOA negotiations and the current Russia-West security crisis related in any way? How is the outcome of the JCPOA negotiations likely to influence the Biden administration's attitude toward diplomacy with Russia? Luciano, please go ahead first, and then if other panelists have any comments, you can you can chime in on them. Actually, actually it's, it's not my main uh, area of expertise, so I, I don't think I can say that much 
uh, about that. But I mean, recently I read that the, the, the Iranians were rejecting any uh, idea that uh, Russia had uh, anything to do with this uh, mediation and negotiation uh, effort. So I, I don't think, again, that, uh, that the Russian uh, have much more uh, leverage on, on the Iranians' decisions that they are taking uh, regarding this uh, this deal. So mm, neither the Chinese, I mean, of course, the Chinese are much more interested in, in entering uh, Iran than, than the Russians, I, I would say. And the, Iran, the, the Chinese would have much more interest in the, the GCPO is signed uh, because the economic benefits that they can get uh, if Iran is not under sanction and they, they don't need to push for, I mean, they don't need to confront the United States by, by increasing their relations uh, uh, with Iran. But in any case, I, I, I don't think the Iranians are, the, the Chinese uh, are neither um, influential in, the, in, in anything that had to do with, uh, with asking the Iranians to change anything uh, to accept the deal. I, I wanted to, if you don't mind, before giving the floor to others, I wanted to comment something that uh, Adnan said regarding the public opinion in Iran. And I, I think he mentioned something very, very interesting. What the people expected in 2015 when the JCPOA was signed. I mean, the, the acceptation of the people about the JCPOA was very high, basically because they didn't know that that much what it was included in the deal on one hand. And on the other hand, because they were expecting that all the problems that Iran was facing in terms of economic uh, grievances would be solved because of that. After two or three years, they realized that nothing happened. I mean, it's true that there were many agreements, there were many deals signed that most of the, um, I mean, uh, China, South Korea, India, they signed a strategic agreement in 2016 uh, that implied a lot of uh, projects uh, and future investment. But at the end of the day, not many of them were uh, materialized. And mainly all the agreements that they were signed with the Arbus and Boeing, they were all canceled. And very, very quickly. So in two years, there were, I mean, the Iranians, they didn't see any anything concrete. So you see in the all the surveys that they were conducted between 2016, 18, 19, that the acceptation of the Iranian about the GCPOA was going down. Uh, I don't know if, the, I mean, if there is a latest poll published about what are the expectations of the Iranian people about the future of the GCPOA, but I assume that actually nobody cared anymore. And as you said, I mean, as far as the, uh, the idea of resistance is there, um, most of the Iranians would not care that much about signing a new deal or not because they didn't see anything positive uh, from the deal. And on the other hand, not having the deal or having the United States outside the deal. And even though Iran passed through a very hard pandemic situation, they survived, they were resilient. So basically they would say, why do we need a deal? I mean, the deal is not needed for Iran to survive because we have enough uh, resilience here, we know enough capacity to, to survive without it. So that's that's my point that I keep insisting that there is no that much pressure uh, from Iran to, to have this uh, deal done because they are trying to de-link relations with the region or with other actors. Uh, uh, that they try, try not to, 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 to link this with the JCPOA. And the people they don't uh, pressure for this uh, to happen. Thank you. So first, uh, Barbara, uh, go ahead. You wanted to comment on this, and then Trita. Uh, let's please keep it brief so that we can get to one more question from our audience. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Just just briefly. Um, you know, the Russians have been helpful in the talks in Vienna, uh, and I do have one concern though, and that is if if we have a confrontation with Russia over Ukraine, that they might not be so helpful. Let me just put it that way. Go ahead, Trita. Dijan, um, um, I, I try to be brief. I, I want to just make something explicit that I think has been implicit in the conversation and I think is actually really um, uh, something that Washington should pay, pay much more attention to. Barbara started off mentioning quite correctly, Iran needs sanctions relief. But needing sanctions relief and believing that a JCPOA will deliver sanctions relief are two very different things. And when I hear of the, uh, perhaps apathy is the right word, Adnan, of the situation amongst the population there, uh, I think we have to recognize that it's quite plausible that a big chunk of that is because 
there no longer is much confidence amongst the large Iranian population that the West will deliver on its promises. What that does ultimately for the United States is that it actually has a weaker hand in the negotiations because whatever it puts on the table, whatever it offers, however genuinely it does so, it is discounted in the eyes of the Iranians because they don't have confidence based on experience based on experience, not based on paranoia, because if it was just paranoia, they wouldn't have been that excited about the JCPA in the first place. Based on experience, they discounted. That really weakens the US's negotiating cards at a, at a table, because it means that the bargaining chips of the US are worth half of what they would be 10 years ago, uh, and leaves the United States more and more just having sticks rather than having carrots as well. Thanks, Trita. Uh, and last question for um, Adnan. Um, how much uh, Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf states are being consulted uh, in the negotiations process? And uh, how much has this slowed the taunt between Iran and these countries? Um, how is this related, this is slow process of the taunt between Iran and, and the Persian Gulf countries? Specifically, I think the, um, this, this uh, is asking about Saudi Arabia is related to the negotiations and what happens to these relationships if the talks fail. We briefly talked about this, but if you want to elaborate, that would be great. Look, I, I am not really aware of how the US um, had its approach towards uh, towards these countries. Uh, what I do know is that in the, in the talks that were held in Baghdad last year, numerous talks between the Iranians and the Saudis and some between the Iranians and the Emiratis, one of the, let's say, side give and take elements was that there wouldn't be too much objection from neither countries um, against the JCPOA. So that in fact, um, when speaking about easing tensions in the region, one thing the Iranians would ask is, dear Riyadh, dear Abu Dhabi, stop rejecting the JCPOA. But that's all I can say. I don't know in what way the US has in fact engaged um, the GCC states or Saudi Arabia and the Emirates to this uh, in this respect. Thank you. Trita, go ahead. Also very brief, I, I don't think the Saudis have had much impact on, you know, the technicalities of this, because that's not what their expertise is. Uh, um, you know, what could they really contribute to when they don't have that type of a program themselves? The Israelis are in a very different position. I think what has happened, however, that it has caused them to uh, be less concerned is not just what Luciano correctly has pointed out is the dire consequences. I think the administration quite likely has also made it clear to the GCC states, or at least to the Saudis and the Emiratis, that they're not going to improve their relations with Iran before those countries improve their relations with Iran. So that the fear that the US would go and get ahead of them in improving relations with Tehran is simply bound to how fast these countries resolve their own tensions with Tehran. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question. Uh, please keep your answer to perhaps a minute. There is much talk about an interim agreement rather than a deal. What contours could an interim agreement take and could it be more likely to come into place than a deal? Could this be more politically acceptable uh, for both sides to pass domestically? Um, any of the panelists would like to comment? Adnan, please go ahead and then Barbara. I'll give it a very brief first shot. Sure. Um, from what I sense in Tehran, there is, there is really no appetite for that. Either it's JCPOA or it's, it's nothing. It's not going to be less for less or something like this. Got it, thank you. Barbara? Yeah, I think that it was a, a fallback for the Biden administration, but I, I agree with Adnan. I, for Iran, there's already less incentive to come back in. Why would they settle for half a loaf on this? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And with that, we come to an end of this discussion. Barbara, Trita, Adnan, Luciano, thank you for joining us. Uh, the video recording of this discussion will be published on our website shortly. Um, also, make sure you uh, sign up for our newsletter to receive notifications about our uh, future uh, discussions. Hopefully next time uh, we convene a session on Iran nuclear deal, uh, we will have a nuclear deal in place and we'll talk about uh, the, the next steps and how diplomacy can evolve from there. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Pleasure. Great to see you all. Thank you. Good to see you. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care.